Here's how we make the things you use every day. You've just bought a new car, and one of its main features is that it has a safe and highly developed airbag system. As a safety conscious person, you're happy about that. But did you know how these airbags were made? Come aboard and we'll take you on a tour of the factory where they are made. There they start by making the fabric for the airbags, a material woven by huge machines. Once the fabric is made, it is dipped in a liquid and coated with a rubbery material to make it more resistant. After that, the machines will take care of cutting the fabric and sewing it in such a way as to make a kind of cushion. They are then installed in the steering wheels, dashboards, and side parts of the cars. During installation, the airbags are connected to a very complex system that causes them to be triggered and inflated as soon as the car is hit. Moreover, long before they are installed in the vehicles, the airbags are crash tested to ensure their quality. You find this very simple compared to what you imagined, and it doesn't make you feel very comfortable. Don't worry, the people who make airbags have done more than just sewing studies. So get in your car and drive with peace of mind. You've just finished eating and have some leftovers that you don't want to waste. They will be used for tomorrow's lunch. So you cover your dish with foil before placing it in the fridge. Once you unroll your roll of aluminum foil, a question comes to mind. How do they make such thin sheets out of metal? We'll answer that right away. Just follow us. Aluminum comes to the factory in huge blocks which are melted down in 750 degrees. Once transformed into liquid, it is cast into an ingot mold, a water-cooled frame when it solidifies and takes the form of large plates. It is passed to the machine that will take care of the elimination of impurities. Then comes the rolling stage, where the plate is passed to the rolling mill under very high temperatures. The more it passes through the rolling mill, the more its thickness shrinks. It will pass between 12 and 16 times until it reaches the desired thickness. Then comes the winding. Before passing once again to the rolling mill, this time the operation will be done cold to obtain the sheet you all know. The rolls are cut on each edge according to required width and finished with the machine for perfect tracing. A huge ingot can be used to obtain 850 rolls of aluminum foil. Between hot and cold, you've had your fill for today, but at least you have the answer to your question. You're playing with your little sister at Barbie and you're wondering how she can love these ugly dolls. You're especially wondering how they are made. Since you seem to be bored, I'll explain the manufacturing process while you wait for your little sister to finish playing. At the factory, we first create a paste by melting plastic pellets in an oven. Once the dough is formed, it is passed while still hot into a mold so that the body or rather the abdomen of the dolls takes the desired shape. Then the same thing is done with the legs, arms, and heads. The limbs are joined to the body, and the heads are first painted and the mouth and eyes are colored. And then the blonde hair that your little sister loves to cut is sewn on. After that, the doll is assembled in its entirety, waiting for her clothes to finish being sewn. Once dressed, styled, and finished, she is carefully placed in her package waiting for a little girl to come and buy her. Does it horrify you to see these dolls stripped like this? Rest assured, your little sister will never know, at least for now. Now you have another reason to find them even more horrifying. You never miss any tennis championship. Neither Davis Cup, nor Roland Garros, nor Wimbledon, and yet, I'm sure you don't know how the famous little yellow balls that make you happy are made. Don't worry, you're here to find out. It is generally in the suburbs of the Thai capital that a factory of the American group Wilson manufactures the tennis balls. 6.50 centimeters of diameter, 57.5 grams. This object seems banal, and yet, its manufacture is very complex since the ball undergoes about 20 operations before being finished. First, we take the natural rubber that we harvest in Vietnam and Malaysia, which we knead and shape in hydraulic presses. It then takes the form of small, very rigid shells that are then lined with felt, a mixture of cotton, wool, and nylon fibers that have been previously treated against humidity so that the bales do not become heavy. These are large rolls of hundreds of meters of fluorescent yellow carpet which once cut into small rectangles and will wrap the balls. The balls will pass under a cascade of glue which will fix the felt when they are compressed in metal boxes. The balls are composed of two half spheres inside which a pressure is put which gives them this capacity of rebound, an obligatory step. 
The bales are then transferred to vacuum packaging so that they do not deflate. You're out of breath following this long process, but now you know that each little tennis ball has come a long way before reaching the court. You're a candy, gum, and marshmallow lover. You're eating them right now. Do you know how they were made? Where do they come from? No, it's not from plants. We'll show you everything in one picture, but be careful, you need to have a strong heart. Your candy comes from this animal, the pig. We start by putting the animals in the oven, we skin them, we remove the top layer of skin, the skin is then processed and put into large bags to be transferred to the candy factory. There, the skin is washed before undergoing a great process to be transformed into gelatin. The latter takes the form of flakes that are incorporated into candy recipes. These last ones made essentially of sugar become then gelatinous. It is what gives us the famous smurf for the strawberry tagata. You are disgusted to learn that your candy has gone from this to that, and you don't want to take it anymore. It's high time for you to get into the healthy lifestyle. You're having friends over for a drink and you pull out of the packages of crackers you have in your cupboards. You think these saltines crackers are so good you can't believe they're made in a machine. Come with me, I'll show you just how they're made. It's all in the secret recipe. At the factory, the dough makers start by mixing the ingredients and putting them into a giant kneading machine that will knead the dough well. Once that's done, they'll season the dough and put it back into the mixer for another round. After that, the mixture is put into trays to be directed to the rolling mill. There, the dough is rolled out very thinly and then passed through another machine, a sort of giant cookie cutter, which will cut the little squares evenly. The crackers are then put in the oven for baking. Once they are out, they are immediately collected and packed in the plastic bags. Since you've already finished one package while I was talking to you, you'll have to go buy some more before your friends show up. Now you know that these crackers are made in good hygienic conditions. Another reason to keep buying them. You're at home. It's late. You're hungry, but you don't feel like cooking. You open your cupboard and find a box of instant noodles that you like. You start preparing them, and while waiting, you wonder how they should make something so simple to prepare. To find out, follow me. Here we are at the factory that makes these instant noodles. First, there's this dough machine that makes the dry ingredients like Italian pasta. It kneads and then passes the dough into the huge machine that shapes them into long zigzag strands. Once the noodles are made, they dry and wait to be put directly into the boxes. After that, following a well-determined chain, the boxes pass one by one under a slit that releases the small packets of spices and sauce that are prepared separately. Then the boxes are packed and vacuum sealed. It's as easy to make them as it is to prepare them. I can feel your tummy rumbling. I know I spoke a little too much and your noodles are already ready. All that's left is for me to wish you bon appetit. Now you know where the noodles you eat come from. You are addicted to everything related to makeup, fashion, and glitter. At home, you have an array of makeup brushes. But have you ever wondered how they are made? You who use them daily should know how they got to your dresser. Well, you don't know. That's okay. That's why you're here. Follow me, I'll take you to the factory of your dreams. To make makeup brushes, there is a long process to follow. Women start by selecting brush hairs that are of very good quality. They assemble them into small bundles which they will comb through several times to remove the hairs that are not of the same caliber as the others. Then other workers will divide these bundles into small bunches which they will bind with the thread and which they will shape to perfection just with the hand so as to form the first sketches of the brush. On the other side, other employees are simultaneously working on the handle that will join the bristles of the brush, including putting glue on it. The two parts are then joined together before passing under a kind of hammer to make the small pressure that gives the brush this flat shape, so that the hairs remain well stuck and trapped in the handle. I told you this would be a long process and you would have a hard time keeping up, but now you know where all your money's going. You come home from a tiring day and all you want to do is lie in your soft bed. By the way, did you know how foam mattresses were made? Whatever you may think, it's not like that in real life. The foam that makes up mattresses is basically a foamy liquid. This is polyurethane, which will be poured into a large baking tray and then placed in a large oven. The thicker this liquid is, 
the denser the foam will come out. As it cooks and dries, the foamy mixture triples in volume much like a cake. Then, once taken out of the oven, it is a very dense block that will be shaped according to the dimensions required for the mattress. That's it. It's that simple. Now I know that I have delayed your nap and that you are dying of sleep. I won't keep you any longer than that. Now that you know how your mattress was made, you can rest easy. Your little niece begs you to do some coloring with her, and you gladly accept. But in the middle of the activity, she asks you outright, Uncle, how do you make the crayons? Ouch, she asks you one of these glues. You don't know what to answer. Then follow us. We will save you. It's easier than you think. We start by mixing the powder, which will be used to make the mine with the liquid so as to create a paste. This paste will then be molded and formed into very thin sticks. The hundreds of sticks are then covered with two sheets of wood on either side to form a single sheet, which is then cut into several cylinders. These cylinders are then cut into pencils by the machine. The process is exactly the same for colored pencils. There you go. You broke out in a cold sweat at the thought of not being able to answer your niece. But now you know what to say. Not only will you be the coolest uncle in her eyes, you'll be the uncle who knows everything about everything. Now tell us in the comments what you think of these manufacturing processes. And don't forget to subscribe and click here to watch another of our videos.